And as we're here at this week of prayer, I'm just going to give us uh, individually a few moments to commune with the Lord in our own hearts, to spend time talking with our Savior. And after those few moments, I will close in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful that you have carved out this special time for us to be able to come and to kneel before you, to be able to acknowledge you as the sovereign of the universe, to be able to hear words from heaven. Dear Lord, we are desiring a special experience. The Father, you know that I've been praying for this personally for my own soul, for the soul of, souls of my family. Father, I pray in a very special way that you would please tabernacle with us. Lord, we need to understand intellectually and spiritually these truths that are so essential for our salvation. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would please open up our understandings, that we will not be dull of comprehension like the disciples were of old time. And I just pray, dear Lord, that you would please be with my heart and my mind. I pray that you will give me the wisdom to be able to communicate everything that you have communicated to me. And I pray, Holy Father, that you would please keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, I know that there are some of us here that were not present for our afternoon session uh, or our evening session uh, yesterday, but by the grace of God, we were able to go over a great deal of things. Now, yesterday, we went over something that was very, very critical. We went over a subject called a distinct people, a distinct people. Now, as, according to the word of God, who are these distinct people? Now, the Bible says that they are the remnant of the woman's seed. Now, we also found out that another name for these people are Seventh-day Adventists. Now, does everybody remember that? Now, we found out that Seventh-day Adventists have been cut out from the quarry of the world and brought into a sacred nearness to God. And as a result of that, God has given us special truths to be communicated to the world in these last days. Now, just to recap, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 17. Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 17. Now, do all of us have our Bibles? Now, we emphasized this yesterday, that it is going to literally be impossible for us to memorize and to understand and to fully comprehend everything that we talk about in these messages. And so it greatly necessitates that we have a pen and paper so that we can take notes and be like the faithful Bereans and go back and study the word of God to see if these things be so. So Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, the Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the what? With the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now we know that the commandments of God, that that deals with everything that pertains to the word of God, specifically emphasized in the Ten Commandments. Now what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? The spirit of prophecy. Now, we, now let's turn to uh, Revelation 19 and verse 10. Revelation 19 and verse 10. And when you have it, you can say amen. 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 The Bible says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it what? See thou do it not. 
I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? It is the spirit of prophecy. So we see here that seven day Adventists are the group of people that are especially signified by these characteristics. There's no other body of believers on the entire planet that have the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, are we afraid of the fact that we have these distinctions? Now, unfortunately, we live, we've mentioned this before, we live in a day and age where sadly many of us as Seventh-day Adventists are ashamed of the truths that God has committed to us. Now, the subject matter that we have for this evening is something called Alpha and Omega. Now, who is the Alpha and Omega? Jesus. But we're also going to find out that Satan has an Alpha and he has an Omega. And this Alpha and Omega is one of the great reasons as to the, as to the reasons why the work of God has not been finished on this earth. In the light of that, we're going to look at our screen here. Now, does everybody see who this person is? So this is an artist's rendition of a person by the name of Samson. Now, do you think that Samson greatly prized the fact that he was an Israelite and especially the fact that he was a Nazarite? Do you think that Samson liked the idea that he was a Nazarite? Now let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Judges. Because the experience of Samson is going to lay the foundation for our study for this evening. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Judges. Judges. And we're going to start in chapter 13. Judges chapter 13, we're going to start in verse 1. The Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. It's so sad that even though God did all of these amazing things for the children of Israel, they were constantly falling into apostasy. Now, do you think that there's any parallel between the children of Israel and us today as Seventh-day Adventists? Yes. Yes. It says, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines. How many years? Forty Forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah and of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, his wife, and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a what? And bear a son. Now we all know the story that God raised up Samson to do a great work for the deliverance of Israel. But as we're going to find out is that sadly, Samson did not like the fact that he was a distinct individual. Now, notice this. Everybody see what this is now. Now, what is this uh, person? What is the the sex of this person? A female. Now, do we think that females have been the downfall of a lot of uh, supposedly righteous men? Can we think of any righteous persons that have been decimated by the attractions of strange women? David, who else? Solomon, who else? Samson, yes, the list goes on and on and on and on. You know, we we literally live in a day and age. It doesn't matter what the denomination is, where we have so many pastors and teachers and elders falling into fornication and adultery and absolutely nothing is done about it now notice this this is taken from a book called education now who here has heard of the book education yes now notice what this says on page 49 it says the discipline and training that god appointed for israel would cause them notice in all their ways of life There was no aspect of their life that was uh, exempt from this to differ from the people of other nations. This is a question for us. Do we enjoy the fact that we are supposed to be different from everybody else? Notice what this goes on to say. This peculiarity, which should have been regarded as a special privilege and blessing was to them what? 
it was unwelcome. So in modern terms, they did not like the fact that they were given a health message. They were not, they didn't like the fact that God told them that they were to marry a specific set of individuals. They did not like the fact that God gave them a distinct form of education. They did not like the fact that in all of these areas of life, that their peculiarity was to set them apart from the degradation of the world. The simplicity and self-restraint essential to the highest development they sought to exchange for the pomp and self-indulgence of heathen peoples. Now, do you think that that was Samson's problem? Do you think that self-indulgence was his issue? Now, let's turn to Judges 14. Let's turn to Judges chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse 1. Now, remember, we're talking about the Alpha and the Omega. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And I'll tell definitely something for the men that are currently present in here. The Bible makes it very clear that as a man that you have been called to maintain a very high level of moral integrity. Sadly, many of us as husbands, as, as single men, we're giving our minds and hearts to the adulteries and fornications of the world. We're viewing things that we should not be viewing. And as a result of that, there is a lack of strength within the church. You know, the book Education says that the greatest want of the world is the want of men who cannot be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. All right. Before we get to that, let's continue reading Judges. It says, and he came and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all thy people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And please, young people, listen to me, please. Satan has done so much to destroy the influence of young people by encouraging them to marry individuals that they should not be marrying. And I'll even say this, even if you are interested in a person and they may profess to be a Christian, but if they have not accepted the distinct truths of the three angels' messages, you are forbidden to unite with them. It says, or among thy people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines, and Samson said unto his father, get her for me, for she pleaseth me what? For she pleaseth me well. And in light of that backdrop, we're going to go into our study called Alpha and Omega. Now, does anybody know who this individual was? Now, this man is very prominent in seven-day Adventist history and in world history at large. This is a man by the name of John Harvey Kellogg. Anybody ever heard of him? John Harvey Kellogg is the man responsible for the formation of something called cornflakes. This man, along with his associates, literally invented breakfast cereal, and this man used to be a seven-day Adventist. Now, let's see some of the history of John Harvey Kellogg. Now, this is taken from the spirit of prophecy. Notice what this says. Before I came to this conference... I was in doubt as to where to stay during the meeting. This is Sister White talking. Dr. Kellogg had courteously invited me to make his house my home. The question arose, it will be said that Dr. Kellogg had influenced me. So to get the context, Sister White had to speak at a conference and she didn't want to stay at Kellogg's house because she didn't want people to get the wrong influence. Or perception. Now we're going to jump a little bit further. This says, as I was praying, a soft light filled the room, bringing with it a fragrance as of beautiful flowers. Then a voice seemed to say, accept the invitation of my servant, John Kellogg. So this is Jesus speaking. To make his house your house. Now notice what Christ said about John Harvey Kellogg. 
I have appointed him as what? As my physician. I mean, just imagine this. Jesus was literally saying that John Harvey Kellogg is my physician. Of all of the physicians that were in the world at that time, God was saying that John Harvey Kellogg is my physician. And you can be an encouragement to him. This is why I am staying at Dr. Kellogg's house. I wish in every possible way to treat Dr. Kellogg as God's appointed physician. So did God call John Harvey Kellogg? Yes, he did. Now, does anybody know what this is? Anybody know what that is? This is a symbol of something called the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Now, who has ever heard of the Battle Creek Sanitarium? Yes, it did. This says, now this is from PBS News Hour. Now, is PBS a Seventh-day Adventist outlet? No, it's a regular secular outlet. How Dr. Kellogg's world-renowned health spa made him a wellness titan. Now, we're actually going to read that Dr. Kellogg's fame was so vast that celebrities and even heads of state were coming to Battle Creek to get well. In 1888, the most the powerful Michigan Central Railway erected a Romanex train station in a remote hamlet in southwestern Michigan. This says at the town's luxurious Battle Creek Sanitarium. This says passing under the station's arches of a rough-hewn gray granite lake superior brick between 1870 and well into the Great Depression were such luminaries as John D. Rockefeller. Anybody ever heard of John D. Rockefeller? John D. Rockefeller was literally coming to Battle Creek to be healed of his ailments. Fleeing from the disastrous events in his family's coal mines, Thomas Edison, anybody ever heard of him? Henry Ford, anybody ever heard of him? Some of us drive his cars. Whenever they were in need of a tune-up or recharge, they went to uh, Battle Creek. Amelia Earhart, everybody ever heard of her? Warren G. Harding, anybody ever heard of him? Booker T. Washington, anybody ever heard of him? Sojourner Truth, anybody ever heard of her? All of these people were literally coming to Battle Creek and receiving some of the gospel. When I could read all this, now what is this right here? This is breakfast cereal. This is corn flakes. Notice this. This is taken from NPR. Now again, is this a seven-day Adventist outlet? How the battling Kellogg brothers revolutionized American breakfast. Before John Harvey Kellogg, there was no such thing as breakfast cereal. These men literally are the reason why when we go into Walmart, there is a whole section dedicated to breakfast cereal. It's as a result of the Kellogg brothers. Today, the typical American grocery store might devote an entire aisle to breakfast cereal. But that wasn't always the case. John Harvey Kellogg had first conceived of a healthy plant-based breakfast in his capacity as the director of the Seventh-day Adventist Sanitarium in Battle Creek. Medical historian Howard Marco describes the mass production of Kellogg's Corn Flakes in 1906 as an event that took the world by what? It took it by storm. You could simply pour breakfast out of a box. Even dad could make breakfast. Now, it literally revolutionized breakfast. Literally revolutionized it. But this is a question. Who do you think was giving John Harvey Kellogg the wisdom to make this breakfast cereal? Was it just the genius of his imagination? It was Jehovah. Notice this statement from inspiration. This is from volume seven of the testimonies. It says, with great skill and with painstaking effort, Dr. Kellogg and his associates have prepared a special line of health foods. Their chief motive has been to benefit humanity and God's blessing has rested upon their what? Their efforts. If they follow in the counsel of God, if they walk after the example of Christ, they will continue to advance. The Lord will teach his servants how to make food preparations that are more simple and less expensive. So who was the one giving Kellogg the wisdom to make this food? It was God. 
It was God. All right. Now, does anybody know what this is right here? This is a book called Living Temple, and this was a book that John Harvey Kellogg constructed. Now, remember, we're talking about something called the Alpha and the Omega. Now, the sad reality is that even though God was using John Harvey Kellogg, that sadly, as a result of all of the fame that he was experiencing, it led him to cherish pride in his heart. Now, did the same thing happen to Solomon? The same exact thing happened to Solomon. And as a result of that, Kellogg went so far into apostasy that even Satan himself was communicating to him. Now, notice this book, The Living Temple. This says, finally, my son said to me, mother, you ought to read at least some parts of the book that you may see whether they are in harmony with the light God has given you. As we read it, I recognized the very sentiments against which I had been bidden to speak in warning during the early days of my public labors. So sadly, the principles that were contained in Living Temple were against the principles of the Word of God. It goes on, it says, Living Temple contains the alpha of these theories. I knew that the Omega would follow in a little while, and I trembled for our people. Now, when you tremble, is that a serious thing or a light thing? It's a very serious thing. I knew that I must warn our brethren and sisters not to enter into controversy. Notice this over the presence and the personality of God. And as a result of us not heeding this counsel, we get into such things as there is no Holy Spirit. We get into such things as Jesus is not the real son of God. We get into all of these false ideologies because we're not heeding the counsel of Jehovah. The statements made in living temple in regard to this point are incorrect. The scripture used to substantiate the doctrine there set forth is scripture miss what? One of the greatest things that we need to understand is that we need to know how to study the word of God for ourselves. Even though the apostle Paul was preaching to the Bereans, they still went back to the word of God to ensure that what Paul was teaching to them was actually correct. Now we're going to notice what was actually contained in the book Living Temple. Because anytime you're doing research, you have to look at all sides. Now notice what Living Temple says. This wonderful life, now this is talking about our body temples, is active all about us in an infinite variety of forms. In bird, insect, fish, reptile, and all the million creatures. So when this says life, this is specifically talking, he's talking about the life of God. And he is saying that the life of God is literally contained in the birds, the insects, the fish, the reptile, and all the creatures. Which people, the earth and the sea, we recognize one common what? A kindred what? Now, have you ever heard of a movie that says, let the force be with you? I wonder if that force is the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit, it's another spirit, and we're going to find out what spirit that is which springs in every limb and leaps and moves and quivers in every brain. We behold also a like evident brotherhood and sisterhood. So he was essentially propagating the idea that God is literally in everything. This is an ideology called pantheism. Anybody ever heard of pantheism? And this was the alpha of apostasy that Satan brought into the Seventh-day Adventist church in order to destroy the influence of this message. Notice this. Now, has anybody ever seen this man before? This is a man by the name of Albert Pike. He was a 33rd degree Freemason. He wrote a book called Morals and Dogma, which is essentially like the Bible of Freemasonry. Notice what this man says. Now, remember, John Harvey Kellogg says that this life is a force. Notice what he says. The devil is the personification of atheism or idolatry. This is the satanic ideology that Freemasons believe. For the initiates or those who are Freemasons, this is not a person, but a what? 
So according to Freemasonry, the devil is a force. So the force that Kellogg was talking about, who is he really uh, speaking of? He was speaking of Satan. It is the instrument of liberty or free will. They represent this force which presides over the physical generation. Does that make sense? So just like Kellogg was saying that God is in everything, so Freemasons be believe the same exact thing. Under the mythological horn form of the god Pan. We don't have time to get into all those details. Has anybody ever heard or seen this man before? This is a man, this man was a Jesuit priest by the name of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He was a French Jesuit priest. Now notice what this man says in regards to these ideologies. It is a law of the universe that in all things there is what? Now did Satan tell Adam and Eve the same thing in the Garden of Eden? That they are naturally immortal. They are naturally immortal. Before every form, there is a prior but less evolved form. Notice what he says. Each one of us is evolving towards what? So essentially, we're going to eventually become God. What I am proposing is to do is to narrow that gap between pantheism and Christianity. And this was the same thing that Satan was trying to get Kellogg to do. Does that make sense? I can only be saved by becoming one with the what? With the universe. Now, is that a popular ideology today? That I don't believe in God, but I believe in the universe. The universe has this infinite plan for me. And if I work in cooperation with that, that I'm going to have success. This ideology comes from Satan. Notice what goes on to say. Now, this is taken from a book called uh, uh, Pierre Talhard de Chardin and the Modern Age of that variation. Notice what this says. According to pantheism, the universe is a single infinite being manifesting all that is physical and all that is psychological as two aspects of itself. So essentially, God is in everything. God is in everything. Notice what it goes on to say, Chardin in our time. He speaks, now this is speaking of this man, Chardin. He speaks of false pantheism and true pantheism. To him, there is something of an indispensable value, which is distorted in the former. And it says it yields a truth lacking in Christianity, going down to the bottom. That is why he says the trails of a false pantheism bear witness to our immense need for some revealing word to come from the mouth of him who is. And this revealing word is what Chardin calls the universal Christ or the cosmic Christ. Now, does the Bible make it very clear that before Jesus comes back the second time, that Satan is going to personate Christ? And this is the very Christ that Satan is preparing the whole world to receive. The Christ that the Jews are waiting for is this Christ. The function of such a Christ is evidently different from whatever cosmic office of Christianity has so far attributed to Jesus. So this cosmic Christ is not coming to do what the Bible says. This Christ is coming to set up a kingdom on this world. We're coming to a point. It says, I believe that the Messiah, this is Chardin again. I believe that the Messiah whom we await, whom we without any doubt await, is the universal Christ. Notice what he says. That is to say the Christ of what? The Christ of evolution. And these were the ideologies that Satan was trying to get Kellogg to propagate in the seven day Adventist church. This was the alpha of apostasy. Now, this is again from the spirit of prophecy. Those doctrines follow to their logical conclusion, sweep away the whole Christian what? Because think about this. If God is already in us, do we need to have victory over sin? Because if God is already in us, what is there a need of overcoming anything? 
They estimate as nothing the light Christ came from heaven to give to John to give to his people. They teach that the scenes just before us are not sufficient importance to be given special attention. And sadly, do we live in a time where even pastors and elders are telling us that the prophecies are unimportant? So when they are telling us these things, they are actually propagating the alpha of apostasy. They make of no effect the truth of heavenly origin and rob God and rob the people of God of their past experiences, giving them instead a what? A false science. Living Temple contains the alpha of these theories. I knew that the Omega would follow in a little while and I trembled for our people. Now, I just want to make this clear. All of this happened before any one of us were even born. And as a result of it, we are reaping the effects of these things. Now, has anybody ever heard of this book before? Anybody ever heard of this book? This is a book called Questions on Doctrine. One of the great reasons why in the Seventh-day Adventist church, sadly, we no longer believe in things like victory over sin. We don't really preach and teach the investigative judgment. It's amazing. I went to a seven-day Adventist school in Huntsville, Alabama, and this is not just in that school, but in the majority of our Seventh-day Adventist institutions, where you can literally get a bachelor's degree from a seven-day Adventist institution and never once be told about the investigative judgment. Never once be really given an understanding of the role of the spirit of prophecy as it pertains to the winding up of this earth's history. And sadly, it's as a result of books like Questions on Doctrine. Now, we're bringing this out for a very specific reason. Now, remember, we're talking about the Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha and the Omega. This is a symbol of something called ministerial inroads. Ministerial inroads. Has anybody ever heard of a man by the name of Walter Martin? Walter Martin was a very prominent Christian apologist during the 50s and the 60s. Notice what this man did. This is a book called Our Evangelical Earthquake. This is Walter Martin, director of cult apologetics for Zondervan Publishing. Company was contributing editor of Barnhouse's Eternity Magazine. So in 1954, was that a long time ago? That was a long time ago, almost 70 years ago. Still filled with loathing for Adventists, Barnhouse commissioned Martin to write a complete book on them. So I just want to give us some context. As the Seventh-day Adventist church was coming into prominence, all, essentially all of the other um, denominations were saying that Seventh-day Adventism was a cult. And as a result of that, they were going to write this book specifically saying that Seventh-day Adventism was a cult. So as a result of that, they sent these people down in order to do these biddings. Does that make sense? And as a result of that, there were two men that came to prominence that helped uh, to give Martin an understanding of what Seventh-day Adventists believe. But sadly, we're going to find out that they did some very nefarious things. On the left... We have a man by the name of Leroy Froome. Anybody ever heard of Leroy Froome? Leroy Froome was the most in-depth researcher our denomination ever produced. That's actually a fallacy. That's not correct. There's another person that, that was the best, but uh, we'll read this for the sake of context. His four-volume set, Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, and his two-volume set, Conditionalist Faith of Our Fathers, showed how our basic teachings had been taught by many Christians in the early centuries. He became intent on bending everything to the one great objective of making most controverted beliefs acceptable to Walter Martin. So sadly, Walter Martin came to Leroy Froome and this man on the right that we're going to find out. And as a result of the influence of these men, they wrote the book Questions on Doctrine, to prove that what we believe as Adventists is just like everybody else. Does that make sense? All right. 
I know that we're going over a lot of information, but it is very critical that we understand this. I don't know how much we can emphasize it. It is so essential that we understand this history. All right, this is a man by the name of R.A. Anderson on the right. This says Anderson, a former public evangelist and powerful leader of men. This says when Anderson gained general conference level status as the head of the ministerial association in 1941, he immediately set to work to help eliminate two songbooks our people had loved for years, Christ in Song and Hymn and Tunes. Has anybody ever heard of Christ in Song? You know, if you look in our Seventh-day Adventist hymnal, there are actually quite a number of hymns that if you actually look at the wordage, they actually help to propagate doctrines that we do not believe as Seventh-day Adventists. But that's another subject. A committee had been selected in 1936 to work on the project. So as a result of the influence of these men, they actually wrote the book Questions on Doctrine. And we're going to notice what this book taught. It was clear from the start that Martin had three points on which he would accept no disagreement. On all others, there might be some variations, but three were central to modern Protestantism. Number one, that the atonement of Christ was not completed on the cross. So as Seventh-day Adventists and as the Bible teaches, the plan of redemption was not finished at the cross. Now, how do we know this? When did Jesus die on the cross? What year did Jesus die on the cross? As Seventh-day Adventists, we should know this verbatim. 31 AD. Jesus died on the cross 31 AD. He was baptized in 27 AD. Now, we'll go over that. Um, in a few of our upcoming sessions. But Jesus died in 31 AD. That was over almost 2,000 years ago. So if the plan of redemption was finished at the cross in 31 AD, why has time continued for almost 2,000 years? Is that a good question? That salvation is the result of grace plus the works of the law. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, the Bible clearly teaches that we're saved by grace through faith now does the bible say that but in conjunction with that reality do we have to cooperate with the holy spirit yes because can you be living in open sin and still be saved it is an impossibility and number three that the lord jesus christ was a created being not from all eternity now unfortunately People uh, kept trying to propagate the idea that we as Seventh-day Adventists believe that Jesus was a created being. Now, does the Bible teach that Jesus was a created being? No, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus is God just as much as the Father. And the book Desire of Ages makes it very clear that in Jesus is life unborrowed and underived. So this point here is completely irrelevant. And number four that he partook of man's sinful nature at the incarnation. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus took on man's fallen nature, but even though he took on man's fallen nature, he was still able to live a sinless life. And this is what the Bible calls the mystery of godliness. And we're going to get through all of these things before our week of prayer is over by God's grace. So does everybody get the point? So as a result of the influence of Walter Martin, this book, Questions on Doctrine, was written to refute the teachings that we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. Now, this is taken from First Selected Messages, page 204. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place amongst what? Now, who was the one trying to institute this reformation? Satan, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our what? So again, Satan is the one that has tried to destroy what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. 
and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? Now, this is a question. Who here thinks that we as a church have undergone this reformation? By show of hands. All right, we're going to see. The principles that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be, disregard, would be discarded. Has this taken place? Yes, it has. Our religion would be what? Has this taken place? Brothers and sisters, I declare to you tonight that the religion that God gave to our pioneers in the first generation of this church is no longer the religion that we're practicing today as Seventh-day Adventists. If our pioneers were alive today, they would completely not recognize this church. They would literally cry and weep to see the condition that we're in today. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. And in making these statements, I, I, I really want us to really understand that this is nothing intrinsic to us as so many Adventists. Did the children of Israel go through the same thing? Even though God miraculously brought them out of Egypt, they kept falling into apostasy. But did God leave them in that apostate state? Or did God bring prophets in order to bring them out of that degradation? Yes, and he's still doing the same thing today. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be what? Have these things taken place? A system of intellectual philosophy would be what? Sadly, again, we live in a day and age where unfortunately our mission is not saving souls, but it's simply to keep organization. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a what? The Sabbath, of course, would be what? Lightly regarded. Now, do we live in a day and age where the Sabbath is lightly regarded? We do everything on the Sabbath. We go to the store on the Sabbath. We cook on the Sabbath. We do all of these things desecrating God's holy day and still expect the blessings of heaven to fall upon us. You know, I remember the experience of a man during the time of Moses. And unfortunately, this man was gathering sticks upon the Sabbath day. Now, what happened to this individual who was gathering sticks upon the Sabbath day? This man was stoned to death. And it wasn't because God was being arbitrary. But this man was living in complete defiance against the word of God. And as a result of that, his sins were swiftly punished. Do you know that if we lived during the time, that time of the patriarchal period, during that time of ancient Israel, do you, I mean, when you really think about the retributions, even in love and mercy that God used to meet out, literally, many of us probably would not even survive that time. When we think about people like Nadab and Abihu, now what happened to Nadab and Abihu? Now Nadab and Abihu, sadly, they were offering strange fire in the sanctuary. Now did, did God just say, you know what, I know Nadab and Abihu's heart. I know that they are trying to serve me. I'm going to overlook this transgression. What happened to them? The fire from God came out and literally consumed them. And it was even to the point that God told Aaron not to weep for his sons. Because if he were to weep, it would literally communicate to the people that they should sympathize with their sin. Does God treat sin very seriously? Now, what caused the death of the Son of God? Was it the nails that were driven through his hands? Was it the nails that were driven through his feet? Was it the lacerations upon his back? No, but it was sin that was crushing out his life. And to think that sin crushed out his life and we can still be committing sin knowing that we're hurting God and we still do it. Brothers and sisters, God is so merciful and loving to us. So merciful. This says nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the what? Brothers and sisters, I say very sadly that nothing is going to stand in the way of this movement that is going on right now in our church. 
And this is why God makes it very clear that before the outpouring of the latter rain, there is going to have to be a shaking amongst God's people. Everybody remember the experience of Gideon? Everybody remember Gideon? Now the experience of Gideon, he at first had tens of thousands of soldiers that were ready to fight as it were. But what was the final number of people that fought in his army? 300. Only 300. There was a shaking in order to prepare them to do the work of God. All right. Now, does anybody know what this is? Now, sadly, as a result of this omega and alpha of apostasy that has come into our church and done very many things, sadly, the standards in our church have gone what? And I want to make this very clear. When God emphasizes standards, he's not trying to encourage legalism. Now, does, it, does anybody know why God gives us standards? Why does God give us standards? God gives us standards because he wants to protect us. Think about this. The Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Imagine if that commandment was followed, how many homes would still be intact? The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. If that commandment was followed, how many people would still be alive? The Bible says, thou shalt not covet. If that commandment were followed, how many countries would still have their natural resources? So God gives us laws and standards because he's trying to do what? He's trying to protect us. Satan makes our young people think, that when God gives us these standards, that he's trying to rob us of our happiness. You know, it's amazing. You know, we as children, when we don't know better, when we have our mother and our father, when we have a parent who just indulges us and lets us do everything that we want, we think that that is the fun parent. And the parent that gives us restrictions and tells us to do the right thing, we think that that, that, that parent is in cooperation with the devil. Not realizing that our minds are confused. Now, this is a symbol of something called Baal worship. I wonder if Baal worship has come into our church. Notice this. I know that we're at, we're at 830. Please bear with me just a little while longer. I know that we're going over time. By the grace of God, we're going to get out in a few short moments. Anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of something called a wedding ring. Now, do you think that it's God's ideal that we be wearing wedding rings? Notice this. Does the Bible make it very clear as to what the Christian stance should be as it pertains to jewelry? Do you know that there are still Christian denominations that don't even wear jewelry because of what the Bible says about jewelry? Notice this. This is taken from an essay on the development of Christian doctrine. This book is actually going to tell us where wedding rings come from. The use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsor, the ring in marriage, turning to the east, images at a later date, perhaps on the ecclesiastical chant, Kyrie Ellison, are all of pagan what? all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the what into the church now when this says church what church is this speaking of this is actually speaking of the catholic church the catholic church literally baptized all of these practices we get wedding rings from the catholic church now were, were, were adam and eve wearing wedding rings in the garden of eden yes and no <laughs> You see, in order to keep the preservation of the marriage between Adam and Eve, God actually made something called a house band or a husband. And Adam was to be the protection of his family, taking the place of the counterfeit wedding ring. Now, notice what the prophet has to say about this. I feel deeply over this leavening process, which seems to be going on among us, in the conformity to custom and fashion, not one penny should be spent for a circlet of gold to testify that we are what? God would ideally want us to take off our wedding rings, go turn them in for money, and give that money to the cause of the gospel. Who here wants to follow that mandate? 
By the grace of God, brothers and sisters, we have to step fast. All right. Does anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of women wearing pants. You know, it's amazing. The dress question in the church today is sadly one of the most controversial issues that we literally come across. It is amazing how contentious this issue really is. Because it's amazing. There was a time, I mean, forget Christianity. There was a time, even in America, where there was no woman wearing pants. Does anybody know where women wearing pants came from? Does anybody know where that came from? Now, let's see where women wearing pants came from in modern society. The history of women wearing pants as a what? So this article from the Huffington Post, which is not a religious outlet, is going to tell us that women started wearing pants to take back power from the men. This is why they asked the question, who wears the pants in the relationship? This says, off the runway, retailer Ann T Taylor is launching its Pants Are Power. Now, we're going to jump down. We don't have a lot of time, so we're not going to read all of this. We're going to read this one statement. This says, clothes increasingly are becoming a frontier for political activism. Says McLeodon, we're all becoming more aware of the power dynamics inherent in clothing. So literally, the clothing that we wear helps to designate the power that is actuating us. Now, this is a question. How can you tell that a person is a firefighter? By the clothes that they wear. How do you tell that a man is a policeman? By the clothes. Now, what if your house was burning down? And you saw someone wearing the full regalia of a firefighter and you ran up to them and, and said, please, can you go put out my fire? My house is burning down. And then the person wearing this regalia said that, don't judge me. I'm not a firefighter. I am actually a politician. Would you think that that person is being ridiculous? Yes, but unfortunately, this is what we do when it comes to the dress question. Does anybody know who this man is? This is a man by the name of Kirk Franklin. Can everybody discern what he's wearing? He's wearing a skirt. So Satan is getting the women to wear men's clothes and he's getting the men to wear women's clothes. And this is a popular fad in, po in modern pop culture. Now, mind you, is Kirk Franklin a secular artist? Kirk Franklin professes to be making Jesus-filled music while he's wearing a skirt at the Grammys. Does anybody know who this is? A man by the name of Harry Styles. This man is wearing a full-on dress. And it's sad that when you talk about these things, people say that you are being extreme and you're being fanatical. Now remember, Jesus gives us standards because he's trying to protect us. He's trying to protect us. This is a man by the name of A.T. Jones. Now notice what this man says about dress. We're coming to a close. As the sun was the great God, the supreme Lord, and as he exerted his most glorious powers in reproduction, it was held to be the most acceptable form of worship for his devotees so to employ themselves in their powers. Consequently, prostitution was one of the chief characteristics of sun worship wherever found. Does that make sense? The result was the perfect confusion of all relationships among the worshipers, even to the mutual interchange of garments between the what? So when we interchange garments between the sexes, when women wear things that pertain to men, and when men wear things pertain to women, we're inadvertently actually practicing sun worship. In the 18th chapter, notice this. In the 18th chapter of Leviticus, there is a faithful record of such a result. The prohibition in Deuteronomy 22.5 that the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto the man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, was aimed directly 
at this practice in sun worship. So the reason why God put this in the Bible was because he was trying to protect us from sun worship. Does that make sense? Is that clear? This is from the spirit of prophecy. Obedience to fashion is pervading our seven day Adventist churches and is doing more than any other power to separate our people from what? To separate our people from God. Do you think that we need to put down this God of fashion? We need to put it down, brothers and sisters. Anybody know what this is? A man by the name of Devon Franklin. There's so much. We're not going to go through all these details. A man by the name of Devon Franklin. This man is actually a seven-day Adventist. And he was married to a woman by the name of Megan Good, who was a secular actress. Now, do you think that we as Seventh-day Adventists should be marrying actresses or actors? No, we shouldn't. Now, this just goes over the fact that Oakwood University literally gave this man an award for the things that he was doing. Now, do you think that we as Seventh-day Adventists should be encouraging movie theater going? No. Do you know the types of wickedness that are shown in movie theaters? We don't, have, we don't have time to go through all of these things. Anybody know who this man is? This is a man by the name of Diop. This man is actually the leader of, re, of religious liberty for the whole of the general conference. Now, this is not as a means to bash this man, but sadly, he does not even realize that he's actually forwarding the work of Satan, sadly. This is taken from an outlet called Georgetown University, which is the leading Jesuit institution in North America. A discussion with Gian Diop. Now, this is a question. Should we as Seventh-day Adventists be having liaisons with the Catholic Church? No, we shouldn't. And so this man, in this uh, particular paragraph, we're not going to read all of it again for the sake of time. He goes over all of the reasons why we need to be having communication and deep intimacy with all of these fallen denominations. Anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of the Vatican flag that was actually waving at the general conference this year. Now, again, this is not as a means to derail our beloved church. We know that this is God's church. Amen. Amen. But sadly, an enemy has come in and stamped his ranks amongst us. This is a symbol of the Vatican flag. And somebody says, it's not a big deal that these things are flying. The person that says that shows clearly that they do not understand the nature of Bible prophecy and the nature of geopolitics. Protestants, great controversy. Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. Notice, they have made compromises and concessions which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to do what? So even Roman Catholics don't even understand why Seventh-day Adventists want to have a liaison with them. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. And in light of that, we are going to come to a close. We still had another slide to go through, but by the grace of God, we're going to pick back up tomorrow right upon this point. Now, brothers and sisters, has it been made very clear that there is a reformation that needs to take place amongst us as Seventh-day Adventists? A true reformation. Because by the grace of God, we need to get back to true biblical godliness. And this is not to be misconstrued. This does not mean that simply if we just take off the wedding ring, if we just simply start dressing right, that we're going to have the Holy Spirit but the Bible makes it very clear that if we love Jesus, we will do everything that he asks us to do. Because think about this. If we can't even take off a wedding ring for Jesus, are we going to be willing to die for him? If we can't even uh, stop eating a piece of chicken for Jesus, are we going to be willing to die for him? No, we're not. F friends, it is a radical change that we need to undergo and by the grace of God we need to be like Joshua that it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing but as for me and my house we are going to decide that we are going to serve the Lord 
And if that is your desire, I invite you to stand. I invite you to stand. If you want to say that, I see that I have deviated from the path of the Lord. Many of these things I have never even heard before, but I hear the Lord's uh, voice speaking to me personally, and I want to walk in the ways of righteousness. I want to walk in the ways of righteousness. And in light of that, let us kneel and have a word of prayer as far as possible. Dear Father in heaven, dear Lord, there is so much that we need to understand for this time. Dear Lord, I pray in a very special way, dear Heavenly Father, that you would please be with our hearts and minds, be with everything that we have learned this evening of the Alpha and the Omega of apostasy. Dear Father, we've seen some of the work on pardon that Satan has done in order to distract us from the work that you are seeking to do for our salvation. He has put in front of us all of these idols that have taken away our attention. But dear Father, we want to put these things away. We want to know Jesus personally. Because it is impossible to have the intimacy with our Lord and Savior the way you desire as long as we are holding on to these things. And just like the hymn says that we need to say, take the world but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name. But his love abideth ever through eternal years the same. Oh, the height and depth of mercy. Oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption. Pledge of endless life above. And dear Father, I pray that you be with every family that is here represented. We're going to go over many things by the grace of God before this week of prayer is over. And I just pray that you would be with our understanding. Help us to go back and study these things intently to see if these things be so. Don't just take the minister's word for it. The Lord, help us to have an urgency about our experience with you. And I just pray, Holy Father, that you would please keep us to this end until we come back tomorrow night. In Jesus' name, amen.